Hi, my name is Jeff Grove, and I want to welcome you to the webinar on the benefits of calorimetry for cement and concrete. There are five things that uh, I'll cover today in the webinar. First, I want to give you an understanding of the basic theory for both uh, an isothermal and a semi adiabatic calorimeter. We'll then talk about the benefits of calorimetry for cement and concrete in particular, and I'll do that through uh, a number of example applications. Then we'll talk a little bit about the actual instruments, the two uh, types of instruments that we supply, the iCal, which is an isothermal calorimeter, and the FCal, which are semi-adiabatic devices. And then we'll move into why you might want to consider buying a Calmetrics calorimeter. And then I'll finish up with some tools for additional learning. So first of all, I want to talk about the basic definition of calorimetry. And basically, Almost all chemical reactions or physical transformations involve some type of heat release or uptake. In other words, uh, during a reaction, uh, there might be heat required, so it may be an endothermic reaction, or heat may be evolved from the transition, and it may be, therefore, an exothermic reaction. So basically, the measurement and interpretation of this heat exchange with the environment is basically the science of calorimetry. Let's first talk about the basic principles of an isothermal calorimeter. Here you see a schematic of a isothermal calorimeter. And let's start on the inside with the sample and the reference. The sample in our case sits inside of a 125 milliliter sample cup. These are reusable sample cups. We'll talk about those uh, in a little bit. And then we run that uh, against a reference material. This is typically a metal material, something that has no reaction um, as, we, as we run the experiment. This is a differential technique. So we're looking at the data um, in a differential form in order to improve baseline noise. The sample sits, both the sample and the reference, sit on top of what we call heat flow sensors. These are actually thermoelectric devices and they in turn connect to uh, a heat sink, in this case, a large uh, aluminum mass of, of metal. So this constitutes the calorimeter, and that entire calorimeter sits within uh, this blue um, temperature controlled chamber. So we can control the temperature within that environment and around the sample at a very precise uh, temperature, anywhere from five to 60 degrees C so we can control that temperature very precisely. So what happens when the sample goes through some type of reaction? Well, let's, let's uh, use the illustration of a cement cure, which is an exothermic reaction. So as that reaction takes place, the temperature starts to rise in the sample. The temperature then basically is, uh, is higher than the environment. So in order for the system to come in equilibrium, heat basically flows from the sample through the heat flow sensor into the heat sink. And as that heat flows across those heat flow sensors, that's what we measure within the heat flow sensor. They actually, the raw signal coming out of those heat flow sensors is a voltage signal. And then during the manufacturing process, we calibrate that voltage to heat flow in watts. Uh, so that's the fundamental uh, signal that comes out of the instrument is voltage that gets converted uh, to uh, heat flow in, in watts. Uh, this is what the actual instrument looks like here on the right. The lid is removed from the uh, instrument and you see inside to the actual calorimeter. In this case, this is an, what we call an eight channel device, which means that we can run eight, sample, uh, eight samples simultaneously. Uh, the, in this case, the references are built up underneath the sample container, so you only see the actual uh, sample um, containers here for, uh, for this particular model. We have different models with different number of channels based on the throughput that's required in the laboratory. And then this entire calorimeter sits inside of this temperature controlled chamber. And over here on the left-hand side, the lid is installed back on to the, uh, to the instrument to enclose that uh, um, uh, thermostat. And then we have a computer that is used to set up the experiments and run the, uh, um, run the experiments and, and analyze the data. So you can tell these are benchtop instruments. They take up very little space. 
uh, especially compared to some of the classical tools that you use currently in your cement and concrete labs to uh, analyze materials. So that's what the instrument looks like. Let's look at what the data looks like from an isothermal uh, calorimeter. Here you see on the y-axis power. We typically will normalize the data per gram of cement. So in this case, we've got power in watts per gram as a function of time. And you'll notice here the time frame is very long. So these experiments are very slow experiments. They take place over long periods of time. As you know, the curing of cement is a very long-term reaction. And these instruments are designed to pick up that small amount of heat that gets uh, evolved from the, uh, from the reaction. And typically, we're running anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, sometimes longer, uh, with these experiments. This happens to be two different uh, cement samples, and you can, you can see uh, some pretty drastic differences between these two samples. If I blow up just this part of the curve, there are a couple things going on. Of course, as you know, as soon as you add water to the cement or concrete, uh, the reaction takes place, takes place also, almost immediately. So typically we do that outside of the calorimeter and then put the sample into the calorimeter. So that reaction is taking place almost instantaneously. And you see here as that reaction gets damped down uh, and then we come into the dormant phase for the cement. So all this happens very early on and uh, depending on the type of reaction that happens, you have a more or less time associated with the dormant phase before the main reaction then starts to kick off. There's one other thing we do with this data. The isothermal devices are considered quantitative. So this is quantitative data. This is absolute uh, power. And if you integrate this curve, so you're integrating power over time, you get energy. So another type of curve that we look at are these continuous energy curves. So here we're plotting energy and now in joules per gram as a function of time. And these are uh, gradually increasing continuous curves. So at any particular point, this illustrates how much heat actually has been evolved from that sample uh, over that period of time. So we use this date, we use both sets of data in, in the typical types of applications that we, uh, uh, that we use the calorimeter for. Of course, as you know, the reaction in cement and concrete are very long-term reactions. The reaction goes on for, for many, many days. Um, and so much of what's happening happens very early on uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the reaction. And that's what we're most interested in in calorimetry is what goes on very early in the reaction, which is really the, the crux of the the kinetics of the reaction. And so that's what we do in calorimetry. We're probing very early on the reaction uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the cement. So how does this apply to cement and concrete? Well, the curve that we get provides us a number of things that we can look at in terms of the uh, parameters associated with the curing of, of, uh, of cement and concrete. So here's your typical curve. Again, we're plotting here in this case, uh, heat flow in watts, milliwatts in this case, per uh, as a function of time. So there are many things we can glean from this basic curve. Of course, the initial reaction is an indication this is where the, the concrete is workable. You enter into the dormant phase. At some point, the reaction kicks off, and we can glean information related to the set times on the leading edge of this reaction. The peak is very important. Uh, we can uh, look at things like the sulfate balance uh, as, it, as it relates to the, to the uh, peak in the uh, curve. And then the area under this curve is important, the absolute amount of heat that gets evolved from the sample uh, that, we can, that we can get from integrating under this curve. The area under that curve is related to the compressive strength. So there's many things that we can glean from this basic data that we get from the calorimeter. Now let's turn our attention to the principles of a semi-adiabatic calorimeter, the, the second type of instrument that we supply into this industry. And this is a schematic of that type of calorimeter. Again, we'll start on the inside. Here it's much simpler. We, have a, we basically have a sample location which sits on top of a temperature sensor in this case, and then that entire assembly sits inside of an insulated chamber. So basically here, we're monitoring the 
temperature in the sample as the cure uh, goes forward. So there's a temperature rise, as you know, and that's what we're measuring in the semi-adiabatic. Semi these are much simpler devices. Here's a picture of that of these uh, the typical type devices. We have a couple different models of what we call a four channel and an eight channel, which allows you to run four samples simultaneously or eight. And as you can tell from looking at these at these photographs, these instruments are really meant for field-based types of applications. So these are the types of instruments that we might deploy in a QC operation within maybe a concrete plant um, out in the field at the various locations. It might be used by the technical services organizations of large concrete manufacturers. It might be used by the support personnel for our admixture customers who might have field-based personnel that use them to troubleshoot uh, customer problems. So these are really meant to be field-based instruments. They could be put into a back of a back of a uh, back of a pickup truck and uh, remotely located. So what do we measure in the semi-antibiotic? Well, the curves look very similar. I mean, we're basically looking at the temperature rise, but, but basically it's looking at the concrete curing reaction. So the curves look differently, but the semi-antibiotic is considered qualitative technique. Uh, so we cannot integrate under the curves, for instance, to, to uh, calculate the total heat of reaction. Uh, but we can glean a lot of qualitative information from the shapes of the curves and comparing one curve to, it, to the next and so forth. So that's what we measure here. We're looking at temperature as a function of time. So basically, we've got these two different types of devices, the semi-antibiotic and the isothermal. Semi-antibiotic devices, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, we measure a temperature rise within a partially insulated uh, container. Um, these are qualitative devices versus the isothermal device, which we control the temperature around the sample and we measure the heat flow uh, as a function of time at whatever temperature we're running the experiment at. And these are considered quantitative devices. Below here is a photograph that graphically illustrates the difference in sample containers. This is the 125 milliliter sample cup that we use with the isothermal devices. These are reusable sample containers. Uh, you can see here that the sides are angled, so it's very easy to pop out the cured sample once the experiment's done. And then here is the larger sample containers that we use for the semi-antibiotic. These are either three by six or four by eight cylinders. Down below is the typical sample size that we typically use with the instrument. Of course, with the isothermal and the smaller sample cups, uh, we have smaller sample sizes uh, compared to the semi-antibiotic. But in all cases, both with isothermal and semi-antibiotic, we can run paste, we can run mortar, and we can run concrete. And that's very important when you start looking at uh, especially uh, competitive instruments. Here is an illustration of the fact that the curves look very similar, but again, we're measuring temperature as a function of time. These are qualitative devices. In the isothermal instruments, we're measuring power. We can integrate under those, under those curves and calculate energy or heat associated with the reaction. Um, so, while the curves may look similar, this is a qualitative device, this is a quantitative device, we can do quite a bit more with, uh, with, the, uh, with the isothermal devices. You can almost look at the semi-adiabatic as a subset of these. Everything that we can do um, uh, on the semi-adiabatic, we can do on the isothermal, but that's not true in reverse. In other words, we can do a lot of things on the isothermal devices that we can't do from an application standpoint on the semi-adiabatic. Okay, let's turn our attention now to what the primary benefits are for cement and concrete, and it really breaks down into four primary areas. One is performance, including things like set times and strength. Material interaction is a big area. Uh, you, as you know, concrete is a very complex mixture of a lot of different materials, and how they all interact with one another is very important. What might work well in one mix might not work in another mix. And this is a very fast way to assess whether materials interact appropriately or not. There, are, there is a lot of emphasis right now on, on coming up with new materials, replacements for cement, things to lower the carbon footprint in concrete. And uh, we can study those types of 
of, of applications with calorimeter. And then finally is the whole area of process control and cost control. This really gets into the area of, uh, uh, to some degree of, of quality control, um, but it goes beyond that in terms of controlling the process. Um, so these are, these are really the four primary areas. And then overlaid on top of these four is really, you can, you can use the calorimeters for both research and development, so here you might be using them in a central laboratory, maybe in our uh, cement in cement companies or larger concrete companies within their central research operations, maybe within a university type setting or in uh, central research labs for the large admixture type companies, or maybe within the regulatory agencies, uh, the DOTs and so forth. So the emphasis there is on research and development. Many different applications, some of which we're going to we're going to address today in, in the webinar. And typically, we're talking about the isothermal instruments in these types of applications. And then we have a, a strictly quality control type of applications where we use the instruments, the screen materials, or troubleshoot, uh, use it as a troubleshooting tool. So and these are the typical types of applications. Here we may be using either the isothermal devices or the semi-adiabatic. So it could be either or both of the types of instruments that might go into these types of uh, um, quality control type applications or as a process control tool. All right, now let's talk about some typical applications. Here's a very simple one, but a very powerful example of how the instruments can be used. This is looking at the effect of add mixture on the, on the qualitative set time. Here we're looking at five different mixes, um, and the green curve is basically a sample with no admixture. Uh, sample two is a low dose. Sample three is a normal dose of the admixture, and the blue sample is a high dose, and sample five has been overdosed. Uh, we're looking at the power here, so this was done on a nice thermal instrument, though you could actually do this particular application with the semi antibody. So we're looking at power here versus time. And you can see graphically there are differences between these five samples. Uh, one other thing that we're, one thing we're going to do here is we're going to look at the initial set times on this example. And a good approximation that we use is that basically if you look at the peak height here, about a third of the way up is considered the initial set time. And about two-thirds of the way up on the peak height is considered the final set. So illustrated in blue here, these arrows, is a qualitative assessment of the initial set for these four different samples. And so the set times, the initial set times, range from about five hours to 6.75 hours in this example. So you can very quickly, graphically, look at the effect of the admixture on the set time for these, uh, for these four samples. Of course, you can see graphically here the sample that's been overdosed really within the time frame we're talking about uh, does not go through any kind of set. The reaction has been almost completely uh, damped out. Now, what we can do here is since this, this example was, was done on an isothermal instrument, we can also integrate under these curves. And when we do that, we look at this continuous energy curve in Joule's program now as a function of time. So here we're looking at something different. If you remember from a a few slides ago, we talked about the fact that the total heat evolved from the sample at a particular time is correlated to the strength that builds up within the concrete. So here you can see samples one through three, uh, the no add mixture through the normal dose, generate about the same amount of heat at a particular given time on these curves. So that means the strength is about equivalent across these three different samples. However, the blue curve, the, the sample that has a high dose of admixture, um, has a significantly lower uh, heat output at the same amount of time. So the strength is significantly lower. So here might be an example where the high dose might be beneficial from a uh, initial set time. As you recall, that was the highest initial set time but you may pay a penalty in terms of strength that you're not willing to, to, uh, to pay. So this is a graphical example of how you can use the power of what we can get from the isothermal devices to 
look look at the data in various ways and maybe come to a different conclusion compared to just looking at the uh, the set time data. And then graphically, you can tell here that sample five has been completely uh, um, you know does does not develop any strength at all really compared to the uh, to the other four samples. So again, a very uh, powerful simple example of how the instruments can be used in the first curve with the with the uh, um, uh, the power curves that could be done with either the isothermal devices or the semi-antibiotic, but here in this case, this is really only appropriate uh, with the isothermal devices. Let's talk about another example. Here's the effect of ash content and water reducer. So here we're looking at two different um, um, constituents within, the, within the, uh, the concrete, and we're looking at various combinations of those. So um, this was done here on a semi-antibiotic device. Uh, we know that because we're plotting temperature here as a function of time. And the implication here is that the, the two curves, the green and the yellow curves, which illustrate the data at a 20 and a 30% ash content with a single dose of water reducer, those curves look fairly normal and pretty consistent with one another. The second, the, the third curve here, the red curve, has 20% ash, but now with 50% more water reduce, reducer. So in this case, the reaction has been retarded, but the shape of the curve is still normal, um, but, but, but simply retarded. But now when we go to 30% ash with 50% more water reducer, the reaction suddenly does not go very well. This is an indication of a poor reaction. The interaction here is, is not good. Uh, and so you can very graphically tell that um, that this would not be a, a, a good mix in the sense that the reaction is, is a poor reaction. Now, one other thing I want to point out, and it's really true here, it's really true in the example, in the previous example that I illustrated, and that's the fact that all of this data can be collected simultaneously. So if you have a, at least a four-channel device here, you can run all four of these experiments simultaneously. And so uh, and they're also continuous. So in other words, you can start the experiment, you walk away from the instrument, you come back in 20 hours, and you've got enough data to tell what's going on here. So that's a very powerful advantage of calorimetry versus many of the other techniques that you're used to, is that number one, it's continuous data. So it's not discrete data points that you have to come back and collect that data. And it's in parallel. So you can generate data much faster than you could uh, ordinarily. This opens up the possibility of running much more complicated test matrices than you would ever hope to be able to do using your classical technique. So really a great illustration of, of the power uh, of these instruments. Um, the other thing I'll point out is this example is using semi-antibiotic, but we of course could do that with the isothermal devices just as easily. Uh, and we could actually glean more from the isothermal devices in terms of a little bit of better sensitivity in terms of the reactions, plus we can, we can uh, quantify the data. All right, now let's turn our attention to, these are going to be mostly applications related to the isothermal devices where we can um, quantify the data. So one is, is heat hydration. And heat hydration is that, that term is in the cement concrete industry is, is used to um, to, to basically uh, uh, measure the amount of heat that gets generated from the reaction, which is basically uh, an integration of the power curve. Uh, so we're looking at joules per gram of material at a particular time. So here's a screenshot of a specialty data analysis program that we offer for do doing heat hydration on our isothermal devices. And we're looking at the power curves so that's what we do in this application is we integrate under that curve, we plot uh, energy in joules per gram as a function of time, and then we come to particular points in time on that curve and basically look at how much heat has been evolved from the reaction. So ASTM C150, you may or may not be aware, now basically allows you to do this test either using the, uh, the classical uh, technique of, of 186, which is a heat of solution technique, or you now can use the ASTM 1702 technique. So 
150 C 150 now permits you to use officially either either of these two techniques. Many of our customers are turning to uh, isothermal calorimetry to do this experiment uh, in lieu of the heat of solution technique. And the reason is because this technique requires, the heat of solution technique requires, it's a, uh, it uses dangerous chemicals, it's a wet chemistry technique, uh, requires quite a bit of training with operators. Uh, 1702 and isothermal calorimetry is much easier, it's a much easier test. You put the uh, the sample into the instrument. The training is very easy, uh, you know, for for basically any type of technician that you've got in your laboratory. Uh, so it's a much easier test to do compared to uh, the heat of solution technique. You put the sample in the, the calorimeter, you walk away, you come back, and you've got all the data that you need in order to, um, uh, to create a report for uh, meeting 1702 in the heat of hydration. So a very popular technique uh, and applicable to our isothermal devices. Now another great example is uh, the use of isothermal, uh, the isothermal devices for uh, predicting compressive strength. And if you recall back on one of the earlier slides, we talked about the fact that the area under that curve, uh, the integration, the joules per gram, is a function or is related to the compressive strength. So we use that relationship where we can, we can basically use the relationship between the energy, the joules per gram, and the strength that gets built up within the, uh, within the concrete. We use that relationship in order to uh, predict compressive strength. And the way, the, the way that we do that is we first build a model so this does require you to build a model first where we run the experiment using the isothermal calorimeter and generate the heat flow curve. But you also then take that same mix, that same basic mix, and generate the compressive strength at discrete data points using the, the, the standard ASTM technique of, uh, of breaking your cylinders to, to get that data. And then you basically create a model that relates the compressive strength at a particular time to the joules per gram from the calorimetry data. So we do that at various discrete points and create a model. And then once you've got that relationship, then you can run unknown samples and basically predict what the strength will be at long periods of time. So the beauty of this technique is once you generate a model for that mix, you can now come back change various things within that mix in terms of add mixtures and so forth. And by running a, a, a shorter term calorimetry experiment, maybe only 24 to 72 hours, be able to predict out longer term what that strength is going to be. So that's a powerful tool. Uh, some of our larger concrete manufacturers, for instance, if you have to quote on 128 day strength, you know, you have to guarantee 128 day strength. Uh, typically, what many of our customers do is they will, they in order to make sure they will meet that spec, they will make sure they put over the amount, you know, more than the, the amount of cement into the mix than they, than they really believe they need in order to make sure that they can meet that specification. Whereas here, you've got the ability to, within a short amount of time and still be able to quote on the job, find that mix that works well um, and therefore quote the job at a better margin. So for our larger concrete manufacturers, that's a powerful tool. Secondly, if you're doing research um, on strength in concrete, this opens up the possibility to expand your test matrix. Uh, you know, with all of these tools that I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, predictions, uh, modeling, and so forth, it's not that it necessarily will replace what you do uh, on your standard uh, compressive strength, but it's a it's, it's a way to augment the classical techniques that you've always used, which opens up a whole new world in terms of larger test matrices that you could never entertain with the classical techniques by themselves. So it's a powerful um, a benefit of, of using this uh, technique for, uh, for uh, predicting strength. We can do something similar with set time prediction. We can use the uh, uh, the power curves now uh, and model that 
using your classical ASTAM technique for, uh, for measuring uh, your initial and your final set times. Uh, and so the way we do that is, again, we first create a model. So we run the heat flow curves. We then input the data from your, your, um, your ASTM technique and create a model based on that. And then we can come back and run unknown samples, fit it to that model. And then from that model, it develops the uh, initial and the final TIS numbers for you. Then you have a, a nice graphic up here in the software that provides the uh, a graphical indication of the initial set and your and your window of, of finishability in terms of comparing the different samples. So another great example of how you can use the calorimeter data in order to do some predictions. Um, and again, as I mentioned, for the strength prediction, this not, will not necessarily replace uh, the use of your AS10 technique for, for developing the TIS uh, times, but it's a great way to augment that and open up a much larger test matrix uh, that you could not do otherwise. So when you really look at the benefit of calorimetry for both predicting set times and compressive strengths, there's, or there are many benefits. The calorimetry is much easier to do compared to your classical techniques, uh, much less uh, labor intensive. Uh, it opens up a, a large test matrix that you would never be able to do with your classical techniques. So you can get the data much faster with the calorimetry compared to your classical techniques. Uh, this is continuous data versus here, you've got to come back to the uh, and do uh, you know to, to measure discrete data points so for instance if you were going to do these tests starting on a friday you would know that by doing that you're going to have to have technicians come into the lab over the weekend in order to get the data points whereas here you can easily start a number of different tests simultaneously on a friday and come back on monday and have all the data so a very powerful way to increase your throughput and increase the, the, uh, the, the possibility of expanding your, your test matrix that you can never do with the classical techniques. So really the value that's generated from using a calorimeter comes down to two basic things, your cost savings, you get substantial labor savings because you can do these tests in parallel, you can do multiple parallel tests, you, they're continuous experiments so you don't have to come in uh, periodically to collect data. So you have substantial labor savings, you could have savings in lab equipment uh, because you might not need to buy as much of your classical equipment that's much more expensive relative to the calorimeter. So you might realize a number of areas where you can save cost. And secondly, speed. So all of this plays into the fact that with the calorimeter, you can generate data much faster, which means faster development, um, bigger test matrices, faster innovation on your products, for our university clients, they love these instruments because they are tied to uh, publications and this provides data much faster in, in order to feed, um, uh, feed publications much faster. So many benefits uh, of this instrumentation compared to your classical techniques. Again, I will reiterate the fact that uh, it won't necessarily replace these techniques, but, but it's a great tool to augment uh, these techniques. Okay, let's turn our attention now to another benefit of the isothermal device, and that's the ability to change the temperature. As you remember, we can actually control the temperature around the environment, and we can we can then use that, the fact that we can control temperature, in order to look at um, the reaction kinetics. Um, where this might come into play is, for instance, uh, if you want to calculate what's called activation energy. Activation energy is a is basically a measure, uh, a, a tool that's used to look at the kinetics of the reaction. So we can take the calorimeter and we can run at least three different uh, experiments at three different temperatures. And you can graphically see here the effect of the temperature on the reaction kinetics. And then we can take that data and calculate what's called the activation energy. We actually, within our software, in output data, uh, output the parameters that are appropriate to go into what's called, for instance, some of the third-party programs uh, like Texas Concrete Works that's used to 
evaluate, um, you know, as a, predict a predictive tool in terms of cracking and other performance characteristics of, of concrete. Um, so you can use the, the fact that we can get to activation energy with those third party type of programs. Um, but in addition, just, just the power of being able to vary temperature, if you've got a mix that you classically use in the winter time, but you want to see what, it, what would happen if you, if you uh, use that same mix in the summertime, you can very easily do that on the isothermal devices. So uh, again, a very powerful way that we can use the isothermal devices and uh, um, calculate various uh, parameters based on uh, changing temperature. And finally, uh, the last one I'll mention is the ability to use the calorimeter for sulfate optimization. And if you look at this curve down here in the left corner, uh, you know that uh, the compressive strength in concrete is a function of the sulfate content and that there is a optimum sulfate content that gives you the maximum strength. And if you put more sulfate in or less, uh, you go on either side of that peak. So there's a there's an optimum sulfate content. You put more than that in, you're wasting money. If you don't put enough in, you may not develop enough strength. Well, as it turns out, if you look at the heat of hydration uh, in joules per gram, so now we're using the fact that we can quantify the data, uh, the shape of that curve is similar. In other words, we it has the same relationship. So we use that relationship uh, in calorimetry in order to optimize the sulfate content, but doing it with a very simple calorimeter test versus the test that you have to do here, which is basically based on the ASTM technique where you, uh, you create cubes and you break the cubes and so forth. So we can do this test with a calorimeter. It's very easy to do. You're not even limited to, uh, for instance, running the three samples. You can run, in fact, we recommend running more samples because it gives you more data points. And because it's such an easy test to do, and if you've got an eight channel device, you can be running all eight samples simultaneously and really hone in on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, the optimum sulfate content at much less time uh, than you ever could do with uh, using the ASTM technique. So this is a technique that's really gaining a lot of popularity with many of our users. It really opens up the possibility of doing sulfate optimization almost as a QC tool. Uh, many of our customers um, you know, will only do this periodically. They, there, there may only be one lab within their organization that does it and other facilities have to send samples in, whereas this opens it up to very easily be able to do it at a local level. So a very powerful example of, of the use of the calorimeter for, uh, uh, for, for sulfate optimization. And as I mentioned, we have a, a specialty data analysis program for this, as well as the other ones that we, uh, we, just, uh, we just went over. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the instruments. This is an overview, a summary overview of the five different isothermal devices that we that we supply, uh, three of which we call our HPC models, which are high performance calorimeters and the two standard models. Basically all five of these instruments can do many of the same applications that we just talked about, but there are some, some nuances and the primary ones are highlighted here in red. First of all, of course, is the number of channels or the number of samples that you can run simultaneously. So that's one qualifying question is, how many samples do you want to run simultaneously? What kind of throughput are you looking for? Another area is how long you want to test for. All of our instruments, basically, there's really no limitations on how long you test. But from a practical standpoint uh, on these types of experiments, typically, uh, if you really want to run up to 28 days, and we recommend our most high performance instrument, the, the iCal 2000 HPC, this really relates to the fact that the HPC has the absolute best baseline, has very minimal crosstalk between sample channels. So it's really the highest performance of our instruments. Um, so the recommended duration of testing is important. Whether you need to follow ASTM 1702 is important. Uh, three models of, of the HPC are, are, uh, are qualified to do that. Doesn't mean you can't 
calculate ketohydration with the uh, standard isothermal devices is just it just means that we can't necessarily guarantee these devices to meet 1702, which has strict guidelines in terms of, of uh, drift and so forth. Do you need to go above 50 degrees C? If you, if you need to do that, then the HPC devices are required. And then how long do you want to, how far out do you want to uh, estimate compressive strength? Uh, and this kind of ties into uh, your recommended duration of testing. Uh, but the HPC devices can can basically be used to estimate a very long uh, strength prediction, whereas the standard devices uh, not as much. So these are kind of the primary things that we key in on when we're talking to customers in terms of really what what kind of application areas uh, are you looking for, and then we can talk about the specialty data analysis programs, things like the the strength prediction and the set time prediction and the activation energy and the, and the heat hydration and the, and the sulfate optimization in terms of what optional software packages might be required. In terms of the semi-adiabatic, we talked about the two different models of the FCAL devices, the four channel and the eight channel. We also manufacture what we call the PCAL 1000. Uh, this is actually not available uh, to buy. It's available on a rental basis. Uh, all three of these are semi-adiabatic. Um, uh, the PCAL is really the device that simulates most mass concrete. It's a, basically a sample of concrete that's completely enclosed in an insulated container. Uh, the FCAL devices most simulate what would happen in a slab. So you, you're insulated on the sides and the bottom, but the, oh, uh, the top of the, of the sample is basically not insulated. So this is more analogous to a slab. Again, there are differences in terms of sample throughput. The uh, PCAL actually can do strength prediction. There's actually an ASTM spec that, um, that we follow for strength prediction on the PCAL. You can't do strength prediction on the, uh, the FCAL. Um, um, so those are, those are the, uh, the three semi-antibiotic semi devices. All of our instruments come with the software, what we call Cal Commander software. Um, this contains a number of software applications. For our isothermal devices, you get the basic data analysis as well as the instrument control software that comes with the instrument. And then these other packages for predicting setting times, activation energy, um, uh, and Arrhenius plots, the compressive strength, the 1702, and the sulfate optimization. These are all separate. Uh, pack, software packages that you can add if you've got that application. For the FCAL device, again, it comes with the basic data analysis and instrument control functionality, and then you add uh, a couple of, of the different optional packages if, if required. I will also mention that the iCAL instruments come turnkey with a laptop computer, so these are basically out of the box, up on your bench, and everything that you need to run the experiment, run the instruments, are supplied with the uh, with the, with your uh, with your order. The FCAL and PCAL do not come with uh, uh, computers. You supply those. Okay, so why would you buy a Cal Calmetrics calorimeter? Well, hopefully, I've given you a, a good idea through the application uh, examples that. This is a very powerful analytical technique, and it's also a proven technique. It's been around for many years. It may be a new technique to you, but uh, the technique itself has been around for more than 30 years. It uh, has a well-proven track record and a very well-accepted analytical technique. However, while it's powerful, it's very easy to use, at least in terms of how we've designed these instruments uh, for the cement and concrete industry. They're, they're very easy to use. Uh, it's very simple uh, training for, for, for uh, customers, uh, technicians that you use to run your other types of equipment uh, can very easily be trained to, to use this instrumentation. It's very broadly applicable. We went through um, many different application areas. Unlike many of the instruments that you buy or the, uh, the, the techniques that you use that are limited to one type of test, these instruments are broadly applicable. You can do a lot of different things with them. They're very flexible. Uh, so 
Um, and they can be applied not only to R&D, but also to QC applications. The instruments are very robust. They're designed for the cement and concrete lab, though you're not sacrificing performance, even if you're in a quality control type lab, or I'm sorry, even if you're in a, uh, a research type of lab. But they're very robust and, and meant to be uh, put into cement and concrete labs. And they're very cost effective compared to the cost even relative to uh, your other classical techniques as well as to competitive uh, suppliers of this type of instrumentation. Uh, they're very cost effective and they have a high value in use. So this is a very important reason why you might consider um, a calmetrics calorimeter. The instruments save you a lot of time and money, um, especially labor, uh, while expanding your testing matrix. So not only do you save money because of less labor involved, but you can expand the test matrix and, and do things that you never were able to do before because you can run multiple parallel experiments. Um, experiments are continuous. You don't have to have people coming back. So that plays into the, the cost savings. So this is a very powerful benefit of, uh, of the calor, uh, calmetrics calorimeters. Third, it can reduce your laboratory capital costs. Again, because you might be able to replace uh, or augment your existing technique, you might techniques, you might not have to buy as much of that very expensive capital equipment. And these instruments relative to that are, are, are much lower cost. And a fourth area is, is very important. And that is the personnel within Calmetrics, the staff at Calmetrics are cement and concrete experts. They came from the cement and concrete industry. They understand the business. They understand the chemistry. Two of the principles came from Grace Chemicals. Uh, one of the principals is a professor at the University of Lund in Sweden who basically invented this technology 30 years ago and really is the basis of the technology that anybody that supplies this type of instrumentation uses. So we have really at Calmetrics more uh, world-renowned experts on calorimetry as it applies to cement and concrete than any of our competitors combined. And that's very important in terms of being able to provide you the support that we can provide. Anybody can sell you these instruments, but it's because of the staff that we've got and the expertise that we have in this industry that you can achieve the high value in use with these instruments. So that's a very important point when it comes to thinking about our instruments versus competitive devices. Uh, and that's one important area. Other areas include the fact that we're the only manufacturer that supply the range of those specialty programs that we talked about in terms, terms of sulfate optimization, uh, strength prediction, activation energy. These are all unique to uh, Calmetrics. A third really key area is the fact that all of our instruments uh, use either the 125 milliliter or the three by six or four by eight cylinders. There's, uh, you know, some suppliers uh, require you to run in a uh, maximum of 20 milliliter sample containers, which may be appropriate for cement paste, but is certainly not appropriate for running mortar and concrete. So all of our instruments can run paste, they can run mortar, and they can run concrete, which is very important in, in many applications. So there are multiple benefits um, when you compare our instrumentation to our direct competitors, and there are many uh, advantages of our instrumentation when it comes to comparing it to your classical techniques. This slide illustrates the fact that buying a Calmetrics calorimeter is very low risk. And the reason it's low risk is because if you look around the world, in the cement and concrete industry, all up and down the value chain, whether it's in academia, whether it's in uh, the regulatory agencies, cement manufacturers, large concrete suppliers, uh, pre-stress pre manufacturing companies, and all of the chemical additive suppliers, no matter where you look in the value chain, you will find Calmetrics calorimeters. So we are, are the largest supplier of calorimeters calorimeters specifically into the cement and concrete industry. So you will be in good company and your risk is very low by adding one of our calorimeters into your, into your lab. 
And finally, I'll provide you some tools for additional learning. Uh, if you go to the CalMetrics website, you will find a variety of resources there. Uh, there are multiple videos. These videos cover areas, for instance, uh, on how the instruments, how to run an, a, 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 an experiment on the instrument. So you will get a very good idea of what it means to run uh, an experiment on either the isothermal or the semi-adiabatic devices. There are other videos that cover theoretical topics in a lecture format. Uh, or application type areas. So a very nice resource for, uh, for some additional learning. In addition, we have a variety of application articles on the website that you can download. Uh, I would encourage you also, we have access to many other application articles if you're looking for something specific. Um, plus the fact that we have contacts throughout the world and a variety of different companies. And so if you're looking for some information, the odds are we will be able to find it for you through either articles and information that we have or the contacts that we have within the industry. So I encourage you to check that out uh, as an area for a tool, a tool for additional learning. Secondly, we provide uh, for a fee on-site seminars. These are usually done in conjunction with uh, the purchase of an instrument. After the fact, we might come in, spend a day or two with a group of folks within the organization and go through uh, training on, on not only the chemistry of, of cement, uh, but also how you can use the calorimeter to understand what's going on uh, in your operation. We can customize these for uh, the client based on your applications. Uh, so this is a very high value uh, offering and something that uh, plays into uh, uh, providing that high value in use that, uh, that I spoke about. Third is the, the rental program that we have. This is a very nice program. It, it is done directly through CalMetrics, not through a third-party leasing pro, uh, company, uh, which makes it very uh, easy. Uh, our customers use the rental program really for one of three uh, reasons. One is if you're looking to buy this instrumentation, but you're just not sure about it, it's much easier to bring this equipment into your lab and keep it there for a couple, three months and really run it with your samples. Uh, these are difficult instruments to bring into a lab and demonstrate because the experiments are so long. Uh, but putting an instrument in your lab for a couple months is an ideal way to run the instrument on your samples. And then after a couple months, if you don't like it, you can send the instrument back or you can convert all of what you've paid in principal into uh, a purchase. So that's one uh, way customers use it. Secondly, customers may know they want to buy an instrument, but they need to wait for their capital, but they want to get the instrument as soon as possible. So they, they rent the equipment for however long it takes them to get their capital. And, and then again, they apply 100% of those rental fees and convert that to a sale. And then finally, you might be an existing customer who, ha who, have a, who has a large project where you need additional capacity. So some of our customers will rent some instrumentation for six months during a big project and then basically send it back. So a very powerful uh, way to uh, get instrumentation into your lab. And then finally, uh, we will entertain sample analysis. If you've got some samples that you would like us to analyze for you uh, in terms of looking at uh, the instruments for a possible sale, then we're happy to work with you on that basis as well. So many things that you can do, um, and I encourage you to get in contact with us if you have additional questions or need help with anything. So with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to this webinar. Here is the contact information for CalMetrics. You can reach us at this phone number. You can send us an email uh, at, this, uh, at this email address, and you can visit us at www.calmetrics.com and uh, get additional information that uh, that we uh, that we reviewed thanks again